Hey, hey, there we are. How's everyone doing this morning? You all good? So good to be with you. You made it. You made it through 2023. Congratulate yourselves. Pat yourselves on the back there. Pat somebody next to you on the back there. Just give them a massage. It's been that kind of year. Woo, we made it. We made it. Some of y'all are looking forward to next year. Some of y'all are just like clawing your way to make it through the last 24 hours of 2024. I'm blessed to be here this morning. And I wanted to honor Pastor Billy and the team here just for having me uh, come and, and, and uh, just serve you all in addressing the Word of God here today. Uh, I want to introduce you to my family. My awesome wife, Tina, is here uh, this morning. Shout out to you. This is... <laughs> This is my family here. Tina there is on the right. Uh, and then in the middle there is my eldest daughter, Nazareth, who is 16. Uh, my, uh, my son, Zion, who is 13. And my daughter, Jordan, who is 12. And they're all enjoying uh, fellowshipping with the kids. They're sick and tired of listening to dad talk. So they're in the, they're in the kids' church enjoying fellowshipping uh, with you all. And in fact, on Friday, I had the opportunity to speak uh, on Friday night, and they were excited to come to church. And I thought, oh, that's great. And said, no, but we're going to the youth ministry. We're not coming to hear you because <laughs> I think they're on holiday from listening to their dad. So anyway, uh, just really blessed to be here. Why don't we dive into the Word of God this morning? I'd invite you to stand to your feet in reverence for the reading of God's Word. We're going to go to Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, chapter 3, Philippians. I'll read it for us this morning. It says, Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining. Everybody say straining. Straining forward to what lies ahead, uh, ahead, sorry, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning that your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path so that we can see the direction of which you carry us. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, this morning that you would activate our spirits to be able to receive your word in good soil. Father, I, th I pray that you think beyond, uh, you help me to think beyond myself to, to be able to serve this awesome church, Lord God, with your word. And I pray, Lord God, that your word would penetrate our hearts and activate us for all that you have for us today into 2024 and beyond in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen. 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 Turn to three people around you, tell them you made it as you take a seat. <laughs> you made it. <laughs> the title of my message this morning is Straining Vapors. It's going to make sense in a moment. Straining Vapors. Now, usually post-Christmas in the Commonwealth nations like Australia, we call it Boxing Day. There are sales after Christmas where you usually get two for the price of one. So I'm actually going to throw in an extra scripture for you this morning, a little bit more Bible. How many of you like the Bible? I'm going to get a little bit more Bible bang for your buck this morning. All right. So we're going to go to James chapter 4, and this is where it all makes sense. It says here, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist, other translations say a vapor, that appears for a little time and then vanishes. We'll hold there for a second. A lot of times when we plan our lives, we often think what will benefit us what will strengthen our financial profile, what will strengthen our career profile, what will benefit our children in terms of their education to best position them to be successful in this world. And those things aren't necessarily bad, but they are distractions sometimes when we do not center our lives on Jesus Christ. So both Paul and James, who wrote obviously Philippi and the book of James, are writing in times of deep persecution. Deep persecution. I mean, James, who is the brother of Jesus, 
goes on later around the year uh, 67 or 69, scholars differ, but they were actually, he was actually stoned to death for his faith, for being somebody who would extend the kingdom of God during that time in Jerusalem. And in that time in Jerusalem, most uh, Christians, followers of Christ, were not affluent at all. They were on the lower part of the socioeconomic ladder. They were poor. And so there was this pressure, obviously, to succumb with persecution and with the economic situation being the way that it is, to kind of succumb to the, the things of the world of Jerusalem, to let go of their faith so that they can benefit economically. And so James is writing to the people, the church in Jerusalem, to not let go of their faith. Here's the thing. How many of you can see some parallels to like life here in Hawaii, right? Where the pressures of life can get on top of you. And sometimes we are pressured to make decisions without not just the consultation, but centering our lives on Christ. Paul supernaturally writes the book of Philippi to the church of Philippians, to the church at Philippi, to a church that he's never been to and never met before. But he's imprisoned. And isn't it interesting? I don't know about you, but when I'm facing trials, the temptation can obviously be to take care of me and mine and not think about other people. But Paul in that situation is imprisoned, and not just imprisoned, but he's being shackled and beaten for his faith many times and still musters up enough strength, enough courage to write a letter of encouragement to a church that he has never met but have supported his ministry for a long time. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because what you see here is two examples of lives that are centered on Christ. And then, in fact, the pressures of life drive them towards a deepened intimacy with Christ rather than shrinking back from Christ. Are you all with me? All right. So the question I ask you today, right from the start, is what is the lens that you see your life through? What is the lens that you see your life through? You know, if you think about any worldview, you think about the way that it would answer four questions. The four questions are, where did we begin? Our question of origin. Question of value. What is the thing that holds the place of ultimate value in our lives? Also the question of knowledge. How can we attain knowledge? And how can we know what we know? And then lastly, the question of destiny. Where does this all go? Now, obviously, with a biblical worldview, we understand, right, that we are created in the image of God. He is the source of ultimate knowledge. He is also the one who holds ultimate value. And he is the one that has destiny and purpose for your life. How many of you believe that this morning? And that's the lens of which we see life now. And that's the lens of which Paul sees this life. And that's also the lens of which James sees this life. And now the encouragement is for us to see life this way, through the lens of Christ, because this life is but a vapor. It'll be gone. It'll be done before you know it. Now, studies show, intensive studies and research show at UH Manoa that 100% of people that exist will eventually die. That's a dad joke, by the way. Some of you are like, oh, let me just take that as a note. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think about it, right? When you understand that this life is but a vapor, you begin to live differently. As followers of Christ, we believe that God so loved the world, right? He didn't just love the world, but like a girl from the valley in California, he like so loved the world. Y'all you feel me? He like so loved the world that he gave his only son. See, love is, is exemplified by giving. And so God gives freely the best of heaven. Romans 8 says, I have emptied heaven. So therefore, what else is on the table? If God is for you, who can be against you, right? He's given you his best. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not die but have what? Eternal, everlasting life. How many of you are thankful for eternal and everlasting life? That doesn't begin in the sweet by and by after, after this life. It starts in the nasty now and now, right? 
the things that you have faced, like Pastor Kalai was saying, and some of us had the bomb 2023. Woo, it was a great year. But for some of us, we were running from the bomb shelter in 2023. It was a struggle. It was a hard year for some of us. Many of us were facing, you know, we, we were thinking, okay, now we're on this tail end of this pandemic. Everything's going to be all right. Right? And then we get on this side of it and it's still a struggle. And those circumstances are pressing up on us. Do we relinquish our faith no matter how hard life gets? The decisions that we make. I know about those pressures. I mean, society is rough, especially if I go to Walmart and have to see that spam is locked up in your safe, right? <laughs> what is up with that, man? <laughs> right next to the cigarettes is the glass case, like collector's basketball cards. You know, you've got these little cubes. I don't know what those little cubes are going to do, Pastor Billy, because it's like a Samoan Rubik's Cube. I'll just twist that thing off. Pop that corned beef in my mouth. I mean, yo, you'll lock it up like it's silver or gold or something. You know times are hard when spam is locked up, right? <laughs> Only in the 808. <laughs> the kind, man. I was so surprised. I was, you know, walking past, getting my chewing gum, and right under there was this cabinet with spam, different flavors of spam locked up. I love you, man. <laughs> but you know times are hard when you're locking up corned beef, right? You know that. As a Pacific Islander, as a Samoan, as a proud Samoan, you know this, this year is like the kids say, it hits different, right? <laughs> locking up the beef soup. I mean, come on now. I mean, my son loves spam. I'll talk a little bit more about my son in just a moment, but it's funny, you know, he discovered Spam Musubi. He throws the rice away and just eats the Spam. He's like, what is this rice thing? And just goes, oh, yeah. And now I see why it's valued. Like, it's on the stock market now, right? You can buy an ETF with Spam. Oh, it's just crazy, man. But, the, you know, circumstances are rough and hard when this is the sort of life that we're leading. My heart breaks as I've, you know, been in, you're also on, on this awesome island of Oahu every time I come, but like it seems more and more so when I'm walking into Long's, you know, doing a quick run at the 24-hour uh, pharmacy to grab stuff for my kids and just seeing all the heartbreak that just is outside those stores each night, trying to pursue provision, trying to see that the struggle is actually real on this island. You know, Paul writes this letter from prison. James writes this letter in extreme persecution. And they press in. They embody what it means to strain forward, even though they understand that this life is but a vapor. It'll be done. So to treasure what God is doing now and to utilize every moment, every breath that you breathe. Go ahead and take a deep breath right now. And be careful as you exhale. Go ahead and exhale. Be careful as you exhale, especially if you didn't brush this morning. That's on you. But that breath that you just took is a gift from heaven, a gift from God. You did absolutely nothing to deserve it. So when you begin to live that way, you've got to understand that breath I just took has purpose, has meaning. There's, there's, there's a reason why he's given you breath. There's a reason why he released you in this century and not the last century like a great album that everybody is anticipating gets released. You've been released at this point. So either you can see through the lens of that you're a happy accident and you just live for this moment, knowing that there's nothing left after this, or you can begin to understand the power of a God who would empty the pockets of heaven for your sake and understand that this life is just the beginning. Woo! So Philippians chapter 3, as we dive back into this passage, Paul is writing to the church at Philippi in one of my favorite chapters in the entirety of Scripture. And in that passage, he begins to talk about his resume of all the things that he has faced, shipwrecks and whippings and imprisonments. And then he begins to expound on how he is both a Jew, 
someone who was a qualified Pharisee and yet at the same time a Roman citizen. And he counts these as qualifications to speak up. But he says, I count them all as rubbish. In the Greek, it's a much more crude word than rubbish. It's the word, you know, that would describe, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, polite here. It's, it's to describe excrement. He basically says, I count all my qualifications as rubbish compared to knowing God. The Greek word is gnosko, a deep relationship with him. That's why he exists. And then he lands on this part about knowing God. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on. Everybody say press on. I press on. Paul is he's, he's saying I haven't arrived yet. I'm pressing in and on a daily basis. No matter how hard life gets, I'm pressing in to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So it's gospel-centered. It's understanding that I'm not just pressing in in my own strength, but I'm trusting in the strength of the one who pressed in for me on the cross. He's pressed in so that I can press in. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. Everybody say one thing. Now, you know a man wrote this because he said one thing, and there's three things here. Here we go. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward towards what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. How many of you want to grow up in God? You want to grow up in what God has for you? There's a maturity he's inviting you into. And he says, if you want to, you're going to have to lean into this lifestyle. It's the only thing in Scripture. Obviously, we are saved by grace, but our response is what? The one thing, to press in, to strain in, to lean upward towards this upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Mm. Jeremiah 29, 11. I know you all know that passage. You probably got it on your refrigerator this morning. We love that verse, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It expounds, again, it's in a time of extreme persecution that Je- uh, Jeremiah is writing in this, at this point of exile. And two verses later, he says, but you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's the caveat. The thing that we need to do in response to what he's already done is to lean into and to press in, to strain towards him. David, another, uh, the, the psalmist in Psalm 27 verse 4 says, one thing I do, and again, another man who... <laughs> One thing, he says three things. One thing I do, and this is the one thing that he seeks after. He hasn't attained it yet. That I may dwell, not, rem, not, not visit, I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. To gaze upon his beauty, not glimpse, but just take a look at it on a Sunday for an hour and a half. But to gaze upon his beauty all day, all night. And inquire in his temple. To inquire in the Hebrew means to bring your struggles into a place of his presence. There's nothing like the presence of God that that washes over your soul with a peace that passes all understanding. J.D. Greer, a pastor and theologian, wrote, to not live in constant submission to God is to put yourself in the place of God. So we're all at a point of choice this morning. Even as we, before we even move into 2024, our choice is do we, do we choose this morning to submit our lives to him, to understand that his plans and his perfect ways are the only way to live? Or do we trust in our own capacity? Do we trust in centering our lives, much like pinballs in a pinball machine that just get bounced around the bumpers, just living life this way, letting life happen to you? And so everything becomes circumstantial. What is the choice that God offers in his sovereignty to you this morning? Do you choose to trust in him with all your heart? Or do you choose to lean completely on your own understanding? I often think about it in terms of this diagram here, where you are one who consists of of, of three components, right, at the center of your life is your heart, not the biological muscle that is pumping blood throughout your, your, your body, but your spirit. And your spirit is awakened 
to worship his him because God, according to John chapter 4, God is spirit and those who worship him, worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. And so as we worship God and center our lives on him, what ends up happening is it dictates our soul and our body. Our soul consists of our mind, the way we think, our will, the way we make decisions, and our emotions, the way we feel. And then our body, being our five senses, go about conducting the way that we live. But here's the thing, if we look at that diagram, we can see that any one of these things or other things could, could be the center of our lives and we sway towards just our family or sway towards provision or sway towards our career and business, or sway towards our education. These aren't necessarily bad things. They're actually blessings, but we forget the blesser. We don't center our lives on the one who created these things. Are we swayed this way or are we activated by the Holy Spirit coming to life so that we are centered on him and then see these things through the lens of who he is? We see our finances this way. We see our family this way. We see our business ventures or our careers this way. We see the government and how things are run in our city, in our state, in our nation this way. We see our education this way. And the way we raise our children, for those of you who are parents in this room, we see it this way. We see our singlehood this way for my single people in the room. We see it through the lens of the one who is our firm foundation. And this is the invitation that he gives for us this morning. And I often think about it this way. When, as, as I said to you this morning, talking about straining, fighting to stay centered on God. I think about it through the lens of my own life and how I need to see things through a biblical lens, see things through a theological lens and how I worship God. So how many of you know worship is more than just a song? According to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, worship doesn't become worship unless we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before God. So, you know, we love it when Pat and Tony and the team up here will lead us in, in song. You know why we love it? Because it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. It might cost the person next to you if you can't sing. It's like, hey, my hearing. But it, it doesn't cost you anything. And we sing along, you know. Yahweh, you are Yahweh. Or I'm old school, right? We'll sing, uh, he is Lord. He is Lord. He has risen from the dead and he is Lord. Any of you all remember that song? Yeah, all right. See, these are the real Christians. I'm just, just saying. <laughs> he is Lord. And then somebody will come up and say, now it's time for the offering. He was Lord. Can't afford. Right? You start doing the broke man's hucker. Can't find my wallet. Can't find my key. Right? circumstantial worship is not worship at all, right? Worship becomes worship when we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to him. You don't go to a cemetery and hear dead people complain, walking over their grave sites and go, ow, you're so heavy, right? You don't hear any of them complain. You know why? They dead, D-E-D, -E -D, dead. That's the wrong spelling for those of you. All right, just want to make sure. But I think about it through the lens of my own family, right? Uh, what I didn't expound on is that, you know, we, with my three children, and I'll, I'll just keep this brief, but just so that you can understand the story of which God is writing um, in my family, uh, my son, I've got a photo here of myself and my son. This was taken uh, last year. Uh, yeah, about this time last year, maybe 12, 13 months ago, last year. Uh, He's, his Samoan genes have kicked in also. Yeah, so that, that's how tall he was there, and now he's suddenly shot up. He's stronger. This was last week at, um, at Waikiki. We were walking around Waikiki. See, the thing about my son, eh, he sees any form of a body of water. Like, he, you know, it's a struggle to keep his pants on because he'll run immediately out into the water. If you haven't figured it out yet, my son is on the autism spectrum. He's nonverbal, so his ability to communicate with full sentences is very limited. Uh, he can say things like McDonald's, uh, I want to eat, 
cheeseburger. Musubi now. Musubi, Musubi, Musubi. Musubi. He'll sing it when he really wants it. It's like, Musubi. <laughs> so this time last year, it was Musubi. But now his voice is broken. Musubi. <laughs> like, who is this man that has just emerged in the last few months? You know, I love my son so much. You know, but our, our venture often, you know, like uh, of life, causes us to strain towards God. I've seen people in our situations, my wife and I, you know, obviously my son uh, is a major reason why we moved from Singapore to Australia. It wasn't necessarily to pastor our church in Brisbane. Whether you know it or not, you have spiritual family in Brisbane, but it wasn't our main reason to move to Brisbane, Australia, to pastor our Every Nation Church there. The main reason was for my kids and especially my son. Because we recognize that in order to create an environment, and this is what's important, parents, creating an environment for the formation of our children in the image of God as best as we can. I'm far from perfect. And obviously, when you are in situation of parenting this way, you really have to rely on the grace of God. I'm trying to figure it out. And I'm, I'm not here to say that my struggle is higher than yours. But I'm here to say, you know, parents will tell you. How many parents do we have in the house today? Keep your hands up if you, it's been a struggle to parent your, your kids, all right? Some of y'all are too tired to even lift your hands up. I'm believing in faith in Jesus' name. And you will find the strength. And I'm not here to elevate the struggle. What I'm here to elevate is the straining and the pressing towards God and then seeing the blessing that my son, in fact, all my children are to my wife and I. What I see in my son is a reminder to pause and appreciate the things of which God has blessed us with. My, like I was saying, my son will run out into the water and stay in there for like two to three to four hours. It's my son, you know, like he came in here like looking uh, uh, a lot less melanated, if that's even a word. Now he's darker. Can't find him anymore because he's just out in the sun. And all he does is scoop water and just looks at it as it trickles off his, between his fingers. And he'll do that for like two to three hours, just fascinated by water. Anytime he sees a body of water, swimming, swimming, off with the shirt and run into the water. You know, he just loves water. I love taking my son on walks. You know, we do a lot of nature walks because he loves nature. And I'll just be like, let's just get this hike done. Let's just get this walk done. I have things to do. And you know what he does? He, he, he stops and he pauses and he looks at a tree. It's like he sees angels or something. And my wife will tell you, he sees something that I don't see. And he'll stand and stare there. And I'm like, son, what do you see? And he'll just be smiling and jumping up and down. And for those of you who know, stimming because he sees something that I don't see. And it, and it forces me to pause. And then when he's finished, he'll run off faster than I can run off. You know, he's just, so that's the second reminder. I've got to stay physically fit to keep up with him, right? One of the other blessings that he is to me is a reminder of our heavenly father and just how reliant he is on me to create a safe space for his development because he needs me. And when I see that in him, I'm often reminded of my posture that I need to take with the Father. I desperately need him. I, I haven't figured things, whether you know it or not, I haven't figured things out all the way. And here's the cheat code. Christian maturity actually comes with more reliance on God, not less. Some of us think, oh, well, I've been in the way for 30 years. That's the problem. You've been in the way. You need to get out of the way. <laughs> See, here's the thing, guys. We need to become more and more reliant on God. And if there's anything I want to encourage you with this morning is that this pandemic has taught you lessons. Please don't go back, like Proverbs says, like a dog to returning to its vomit, just repeating the things that were pre-COVID. Rather than taking into account some of the Holy Spirit whispers that God has been speaking to you over the last three, going on to four years, there's maturity that is on the offering. 
There's maturity when you come to the altar and say, God, I don't have it all. I don't know it all, but I'm pressing in. I'm straining forward towards the mark of Christ Jesus. So this is the invitation. I'm going to invite the worship team up, and I'll invite my wife, Tina, to come up at this point. The Bible says in, 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 Psalm, in the Psalms, um, it says, We enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. The entry point to this place of straining forward is actually to be thankful, like Pastor Kali was inviting us into, to be thankful for what he's continued to do. His faithfulness. How many of you can testify God has been faithful? I can testify to you through what I have experienced that he is and has been faithful. The mere fact that we are here spending this time with my family in your beautiful state is a gift from God, and I'm thankful God did that. And God wants to invite you into that space of trusting him this morning. We don't know what 2024 holds, but we know who holds it. 